So we have been talking about seven men who rule the world from the grave. And uh, as I have uh, studied this book and these seven men, uh, each step along the way on each one of these uh, categories, I guess you'd say, I, uh, I've been thinking, well, you could have chose this guy or that guy or another guy all who hold the same kind of uh, philosophy. It's uh, kind of hard to narrow it down to seven men. Uh, and uh, maybe these are seven men who mess up the world from the grave. Uh, and of course, they messed it up before they went uh, to the grave. But basically, it is here seven men whose influence lives on in, uh, in uh, shaping the worldview that we have today and uh, largely in a, a very negative uh, sense. So uh, I hope it's uh, been blessing to you, a little different kind of study that uh, we've had here. So we started with Charles Darwin, who changed the way we look at origins. And then we had Karl Marx, who changed the way we look at uh, value, what, uh, what value is, what you ought to pay for something. And uh, in addition there, of course, he went in a, an economic style then that brought you to what you ought to pay for something. And uh, his, his theory was workers are going to see that they're paying more for something than it costs to produce it, and they're going to rebel against that. So that really is the, the, the fundamental of Marxism, is that its, own, its only value is what it actually costs to produce it. Uh, and anything more you charge for that, you're a greedy, grimy, filthy businessman and uh, trying to uh, take things from people that doesn't belong to them. So it's a completely different worldview than we have today and one that has been proven not to work. Uh, uh, well but that doesn't matter. They still try to <laughs> try to go about it, doesn't it? Then there was Wellhausen, uh, who was uh, one of two. Today we're going to see the other one who claimed Christianity anyway. And Wellhausen uh, was the rationalist rather than the revelationist. The scripture uh, was uh, put together by rational men who uh, uh, determined how God worked through history and they wrote it down rather than here's the revelation of what God has done in, in history. Then Sigmund Freud who uh, changed the way fundamentally we look at ourselves with the id and the ego and all that. Uh, John Dewey uh, changed the way we look at truth and in a sense is uh, uh, connected to Kierkegaard although John Dewey's uh, uh, emphasis was much more on uh, mathematic truth and scientific truth and how we educate our young people in truth. Then John Maynard Keynes, uh, I, I said on the outline, changed the way we looked at economics. Uh, in a sense, really, however, he changed the way we look at government uh, that, uh, and the government's role in economics. And prior to John Maynard Keynes, uh, the government uh, paid for everything in a completely different way than it pays for everything now. In fact, uh, we may have mentioned then, and of course uh, you all probably know from your history, that uh, there was not even an income tax in the United States until 1913, uh, and then it was very small. Uh, so how did the government last from the Constitution in 1790 to 1913. Well, they did it in other ways than taxation, but the Keynesian revolution said, you tax and you spend. And uh, this is what, uh, how we run the economy. Well, today, Soren Kierkegaard. You may have never heard of Soren Kierkegaard. Uh, if you have, it was probably a passing reference or you took a philosophy class. In philosophy class, he would uh, be there. Uh, interestingly enough, he is often used in seminary classes, not only in, in uh, philosophy, and unfortunately, he's used too many times without uh, negative reference. Uh, and uh, they'll just say, well, Kierkegaard taught. And they'll never say also that Kierkegaard caused much of the problem we're in today. Uh, and in fact, one of the things that Kierkegaard taught that is very often taught in seminaries is a theory of worship, how we worship. And uh, uh, you, almost every seminary student has gotten the uh, chart that uh, shows uh, the congregation and the leaders of the congregation and God. And Kierkegaard's, Kierkegaard's uh, theory, which is not necessarily wrong in this part, was that God is the audience uh, and uh, we're worshiping God. So God is the audience and the uh, people up front are the uh, 
are the uh, conductors, the directors, and the people in the congregation are the performers, so to speak. And so it created this idea of uh, worship that uh, is often used today. And there's some truth to that, although um, the uh, challenge is that's, that perhaps that philosophy is what drove the church to be music-driven rather than preaching-driven. You used to go to preaching service, you know. Uh, but if the congregation is... Uh, is the performer, then preaching doesn't really work for that. Because in a, in a sermon time, you're supposed to sit there and be quiet. <laughs> sit there and listen, sit there and learn, but you're not really a participant uh, in all of it. So I think uh, perhaps that underlying fact uh, created some things. Well, Kierkegaard came and uh, he died, not according to your outline, which says he died in 1946 uh, and became influential 100 years later, but uh, that would be rather hard. He died in 1846. He was the first of all of these, last we're studying, but the first of all of these. Um, and uh, let's see, I didn't put his birth date down there, but uh, it was uh, early 1800s. He did not live long. He uh, uh, died young and uh, was, like so many of the others, a prolific writer, and I might just say something about this, that um, if we want to change the world, I've become convinced, and you can tell this from some of the things I'm doing in my own life, but I've become convinced the way to change the world is through writing. Uh, the uh, spoken word has a very short shelf life, doesn't it? Uh, you speak it, and it's done. I would, I would imagine that if I gave a test on last Sunday's sermon, uh, very few of you could uh, even... Um, give me one or two points of the sermon. Uh, you might not even be able to give me the topic of the sermon uh, because a lot has happened since last week, right? Uh, and so in one ear, out the other is kind of uh, the way sermons go. Now that's uh, not to discount their importance uh, because a, uh, a lifetime of good preaching will certainly does make an effect. But if you want to change the world, you write it down, and somewhere along the way, someone picks it up. Well, Kierkegaard uh, was uh, one of these uh, that just wrote and wrote and wrote and wrote in his young life, and uh, he was well known in Copenhagen uh, during his lifetime, but not much beyond that. It was a hundred years later that he really became influential, and it was the aspects of the first part of the, uh, uh, of the 20th century that uh, brought about uh, his influence because he created a, uh, excuse me, he filled a vacuum that really came about or was created from 1900 to 1940. And we've talked about this a little bit uh, in our journey through this uh, uh, rather different uh, kind of, it's not a Bible study, this book study, uh, about that 1900 to 1940 time period, uh, there really was a fundamental shift in the way people think. Now, typically, if you talk about uh, American history, world history, church history, whatever, uh, we'll use kind of World War II as say, saying uh, after post-World War II, the world was, was this way. After World War II, everything, everything was different. Uh, Post-World War II, you got, uh, you know, all the GIs and the suburbs uh, that came about and uh, people moving to the cities and rather than ag agrarian. Uh, now they're uh, living the urban life and all these kind of things that we talk about. And even in church life, it uh, changed fundamentally uh, then. But I'm, I'm fairly convinced, especially after studying this, that World War II is just the easiest demarcation point. Uh, and uh, it really was 1900 to 1940 totally changed the way that uh, the world thinks in so many ways. Now, is that to say there, uh, there, there weren't uh, people, you know, in the 1940s, uh, uh, in the 1950s that thought the same way as people in the 1870s? Obviously not. Uh, but the, uh, the keys to the kingdom, if you will, uh, changed hands during those years. And so one of the things that happened in 1900 to 1940 is that religious liberalism really did reign, reign supremed. Uh, we don't think of the early part of the 20th century as being a time of liberalism. And yet it really was. Uh, in, in the seminaries, uh, classic liberalism ruled the day. Uh, in the major churches of the day, classic liberalism ruled the day. Now, uh, we talked in one of these, uh, perhaps it was when we talked about Wellhausen, uh, 
how that's also the time period in which what we call today fundamentalism uh, arose, Christian fundamentalism. And uh, that was about 1915 to 1930 or so uh, was the uh, modernist versus the fundamentalist controversy. And fundamentalism, as we know it, really was created during that time. And uh, it had uh, obviously some... uh, uh, some strong churches and, and a, a huge following, and we talked about some of that with uh, J. Frank Norris uh, and uh, uh, some of those guys. But the reason that came about was a response to religious liberalism, and I'll say classic religious liberalism. And there's a sense in which classic re- re- religious liberal that, that word <laughs> classic religious liberalism kind of died uh, after World War II. And I'll uh, try to point this out, uh, but that's not to say liberalism died, but classic religious liberalism died. And I'll explain here uh, perhaps as we go along. But uh, one of the uh, most uh, prominent preachers during that time of religious liberalism was a guy named Harry Emerson Fosdick. Probably if you've been around the block very much, you've heard his name. Um, And uh, he also was another one of these writers. But he was a uh, classic uh, liberal. And uh, there's a guy, I actually haven't read uh, his book on fundamentalism, and I'm going to. There's a guy named J. Gresham Meacham uh, who wrote during that time, and he was a fundamentalist. uh, And he wrote about uh, Fosdick. He says, the question is not whether Mr. Fosdick is winning men, but whether he is winning them to Christianity. And uh, that's that's really a a good uh, phrase today. In fact, probably the inheritors of Harry Emerson Fosdick. If you had a family tree of preachers, uh, Harry Emerson Fosdick was kind of the trunk of the religious liberal preachers. He was the pastor at the First Presbyterian Church in New York City. Uh, But, believe it or not, even the Presbyterians said, this guy's too liberal. Uh, He doesn't believe in the virgin birth. He doesn't believe in the bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ. He doesn't believe in salvation as we know it. He believed in a different kind of salvation, which we'll talk about later. So even the Presbyterian said he's too liberal, and under pressure, he resigned. He probably would have been fired from the First Presbyterian Church of New York, but under pressure, he resigned. He went uh, then to, uh, uh, I believe it was Madison Avenue Baptist Church and uh, became the pastor of the Baptist Church. He actually was a Baptist before he was a Presbyterian before he was a Baptist. Uh, So he was at Madison Avenue Baptist Church in obviously uh, New York City and uh, had a great degree of uh, prominence there. He wrote a uh, pamphlet of uh, 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 argumentation against fundamentalism, basically a pro- classic liberal pamphlet and a fellow named John D. Rockefeller got it and he liked it. And John D. Rockefeller actually paid to have, I believe it was 130,000 copies made and sent to pastors all across the country. And this, uh, uh, Fosdick was already fairly famous at this point, but this uh, sealed his fame in that every pastor around the country had his pamphlet, read his pamphlet, and of course this was days when you couldn't Google it, right? Uh, So you get something in the mail to read a pamphlet and whatnot, and you would tend to read it. So uh, then uh, John D. Rockefeller came and he built a modern cathedral, uh, his own cathedral basically, and it's uh, Riverside Church in New York City. You can go to there today, it's called Riverside Church in New York City. And he put Fosdick in as the pastor of the Riverside Church. And the Riverside Church was for years and years and years the most famous church in America. And uh, Harry Emerson Fosdick was the most famous liberal preacher in America anyway. You have uh, others of a conservative bent like uh, George W. Truett or a fundamentalist bent like uh, 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 J. Frank Norris and uh, certainly other conservatives known. But Harry Emerson Fosdick was known. So he's the root of this classic liberalism. Now I say this because before 1900, you didn't really have within Christianity any groups at all that would deny the virgin birth, deny the resurrection of Jesus Christ, deny the historicity of the miracles. If you were Christian, you held to all that stuff. Now you might have other uh, mistakes uh, or errors in your theology, but you held to that. Well, now, 1900, 1940, you've got these religious liberals. Uh, they inherited what Wellhausen brought and uh, they took it to its uh, 
uh, obvious conclusion. Uh, so, uh, uh, speaking of the family tree here, here's Harry Emerson Fosdick. Uh, he was followed, even at Riverside Church, by a, another very famous uh, fairly classical liberal preacher whom you also have heard of because he started the Guidepost magazine and his name was Peel, Norman Vincent Peel, that's right. Uh, Norman Vincent Peel, uh, and he he very much uh, followed the line of Harry Emerson Fosdick, same pulpit, same uh, uh, same sermon, same message in a sense. Uh, Harry Emerson Fosdick uh, uh, started, and Peel followed, and probably even perfected the positive message, uh, and taking the positive things of Christianity and helping a person to uh, to deal with that. Well, Norman. Vincent Peale, in, uh, in, uh, actually, uh, uh, he influenced a young man that was in Iowa, a young preacher in Iowa, uh, and a young preacher reading the Guidepost magazine and listening to Norman Vincent Peale. Uh, he took this family tree that comes from Fosdick and Peale, and he moved out to California and started a church and uh, built a great cathedral out there of glass, and his name was? <laughs> Robert Schuler, you got it. It was on the tip of your tongue. Uh, Robert Schuler, the Crystal Cathedral. And uh, Schuler, uh, kind of, you know, the, the interesting thing is, I said classic liberalism died. Schuler would not have been one that would have totally denied the resurrection of Jesus Christ or the virgin birth. Uh, he, and yet he, he, he was a liberal nonetheless, no doubt about it. In fact, uh, Schuler would uh, take things like faith and he would fit it to the individual. And he said that for, for Schuler, faith equals positive thinking. And so he taught positive thinking. Positive thinking for him was faith, and faith was positive thinking. Now, uh, I, th I think, and the, the, I'm not sure the connection here is uh, immediate, but it appears that the heir apparent uh, to Schuler would be the guy in Houston, right? Uh, uh, Joel Osteen, who uh, preaches, you know, here's your best life now, and uh, all of these uh, things. Now, Osteen actually came more out of a uh, uh, Pentecostal type background. His father uh, was a one-time Baptist preacher who went into Pentecostalism and uh, uh, then so, so that's a little more of his uh, background than, than the direct route that the others uh, take. But here's uh, the 1940s and uh, you've got uh, 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 Harry Emerson Fosdick. Now Classic liberalism, I mentioned some of the things, but let me give my bullet points here. Uh, for classic liberalism, the Bible was a human book. Uh, Jesus was an interesting teacher. Uh, was not the son of God, not born of a virgin. He was an interesting teacher. And uh, the, uh, the death of Christ was an inspirational event, if it even occurred. Uh, they might even say the myth of the death of Christ was an inspirational event. They would highlight the death of Christ. They wouldn't have a problem with having a cross and talking about uh, the cross in a sense in that when I survey the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died, my richest gain I count but loss and pour contempt on all my pride. Now, I use that song in a uh, uh, kind of a negative way, but uh, that's the way they use the cross is when I look at the cross, it brings me to my best. And so that's the reason they used uh, the cross in classic liberalism. Uh, salvation was deliverance. So you could probably stop the sentence right there. I put in a blank. Salvation was deliverance from. Uh, deliverance from low self-esteem, deliverance from poverty, deliverance from injustice, whatever, uh, whatever that is. So when they were proclaiming salvation, it was always this deliverance from. Uh, and uh, the Christian hope was no longer, when we talk about the blessed hope, to use the words of Titus, uh, or the book of Titus, when we talk about the blessed hope, we're actually talking about the return of Jesus Christ. Uh, you know, I'll use, just use a broad brush there, whether it's his rapture or his second coming. Uh, the blessed hope is the Messiah is going to come and fix it all. That is... Um, I'll call it classic Christianity, uh, but classic liberalism, uh, the Christian's hope was the advancement of the church, 
when the church is strong, we can fix society. Now, I think some of this really comes in today. I'll get to Kierkegaard in a minute. He really is behind all this. Uh, but uh, I think we see this today and have uh, probably uh, very clearly anyway since the 60s, 70s, and 80s in what is called the church growth movement. And the church growth movement did something that really was unlike uh, any, any previous time in that uh, the emphasis became church growth. Uh, now, I don't know that anywhere down in history there was a time when people, uh, uh, you know, were excited that nobody came to church. Uh, obviously, it's, you know, it's always a nice thing when people come to church. But you take uh, uh, old Europe, for example, uh, before Wellhausen set in, and... Uh, it was a part of society. If you were a part of the kingdom, you were a part of the church. And so the only way to have church growth was to have babies, right? <laughs> uh, and uh, there, you, you were taxed for the church and all these. So, so in Europe, with the state church, church growth wasn't really an issue. Uh, and in the United States, with its uh, Puritan background especially, uh, church growth wasn't an issue. You might be able to argue that it became a little bit of an issue with the Second Great Awakening and Charles Finney and the revivals that were taking place uh, out in the country. But it was a little more of a grassroots uh, uh, people uh, uh, just going out and, and uh, witnessing uh, to people and, and uh, trying to evangelize people. But now, especially after World War II, you had churches programming in order to get bigger. Uh, and again, previously, you, you came to church at 11 o'clock uh, as a... Uh, who was the, the old preacher, uh, the old evangelist? Uh, his name will come to me in a moment. Uh, old preacher who used to say... We come to church at 11 o'clock sharp and we finish at 12 o'clock dull. <laughs> but <laughs> here's, uh, here's the way you did it. You know, I mean, you, you just, th th there, there wasn't a, hey, if we did this program, then more people would come to our church. We should have a youth program. We should have a children's program. We should have a singles program. We should have a bowling alley. We should have, you know, none of that was really thought of. You just came and you started at 11 o'clock and you ended at 12 o'clock. And honestly, I would like to go back to those days uh, because just week after week they came and they heard a sermon and they, they went. Uh, and they did their sermon. But uh, you've got the programming to start the church. Now, I'm convinced that programming to grow the church, if you will, actually came from religious liberalism, and religious liberalism had the idea if we were a bigger church, we would be a better society. Uh, and uh, that sounds well and good until you really get down and peel that onion and see that the idea was the church can fix society. And so we set out to fix society. Well, we started by setting out to fix society by growing the church. Now, every one of you, if uh, again, if you grew up in church especially, have been to a church revival and you had, uh, what, pack a pew night and all those kind of things. And they were fun and they were good. And uh, I'm really not uh, terribly opposed to getting someone to uh, church to uh, hear uh, good preaching and have some singing, right? Uh, but starting there... Then we realized we can pack the pew better if, go ahead and fill in a blank. Well, yeah, I was thinking if we have pizza, but <laughs> uh, if we have pizza ahead of time or we have ice cream afterwards, well, we'll get a little more. And then say, hey, you know what? We had pizza and the youth came. So what if we, and it just began to grow from there and, uh, you know, literally has snowballed to where churches today have, uh, have, have everything there is. It's where the old poem come from that said, uh, Mary had a little lamb. It would have been a sheep but it followed her to a Baptist church and died of lack of sleep. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so we, uh, we, we programmed, I'm convinced, 
uh, I, again, I don't know if we knew what we were doing. We often don't. Uh, but we programmed thinking, oh, this just grows the church. But again, behind it all was if we grow the church, we change society. Well, that eventually ch- even uh, began to grow uh, to some things. And not all these were bad movements. For example, uh, we began to think, well, uh, now that we're big, if we're going to change society, we should change politics. And so we got into politics. We got into entertainment. We got into uh, uh, education. We got into, you know, all these other things. We said, we're going to change these things. And so some of them, again, I, I uh, uh, don't have too much bad to say about things like the moral majority uh, and the influence that it had. Uh, and this was, you know, early 1980s uh, that it began to happen. And that was very much the, the, uh, the, the, the big uh, uh, heart of the uh, church growth movement as it was going. So, uh, all of this uh, came about. So, uh, the, the, the uh, hope of the church. Uh, and then, uh, the idea of unity, the unity of the church. Uh, and the unity of the church, when I say that, uh, and, and when you hear that phrase, the unity of the church, almost never is a person talking about fellowship within the local church. As important as that is, what they're talking about is the unity of the whole church. And so you begin to get, uh, for example, the ecumenical councils. Uh, does anyone know what an ecumenical uh, uh, or organization is today? The, the, the first one that started was the WCC. I'll give you that hand. World Council of Churches. That's right. Uh, so the ecumenical movement began that if we're going to be the hope of the world, then we're going to have to come together. And so they started the World Council of Churches in the United States. It was the National Council of Churches and all these ecumenical movements that uh, began, uh, honestly, are going to come back to religious liberalism, classic religious liberalism, which is going to come back to Wellhausen and uh, Kierkegaard. Uh, Now, the problem is, in the, in the early 1900s, uh, everything seemed to be headed towards utopia. Uh, this liberal church was actually changing its society. Uh, the economy uh, was uh, uh, more so then than at any other time except maybe today. And the only way I could know for sure is get in the time machine and go back. Uh, but more so in the in the in the 1910s and 20s, were, uh, the United States was a socialist verging upon communist kind of organization. That's the time in which the the Communist Party of the United States was out in, in the open. Uh, they were thriving, as we talked about, with men like uh, Woody Guthrie and whatnot. This land is my land. This land is your land. Uh, and uh, so. Economically, things were great. Uh, Politically, things were great. Uh, We were changing the world. We had the League of Nations. You know, all these things were going good. The problem is then, uh, maybe 60 million people, that's a bunch of people, isn't it, died in World War II. And the world honestly did take a deep breath and said, what were we doing wrong? Where were we thinking wrong? And they, they began to, uh, to say, what is it I'm supposed to believe? And I think the problem is they looked to the church then, and the church didn't have anything for them to believe because classic liberalism had taken over the church. And uh, all that uh, the, the Harry Emerson Fosdick could, uh, could give is, uh, you know, today can be your best day. <laughs> Tomorrow can be better. And that's what they had been saying all these years. And now it just came crashing down on his face. And people were saying, no, I'm not, uh, not going to go there anymore. And so they were looking for something different. One of these uh, days, I'll give a, a little lesson. And it'll be kind of like uh, these lessons I've been giving. But I'll, be, I'll give a lesson on neo-orthodoxy. Uh, neo-orthodoxy was the response to all this I just said. Uh, the classic liberalism now had nothing to offer. And so some people like Karl Barth, perhaps you've heard his name, uh, he began to say, we need to go back to orthodoxy. Forget liberalism, it's dead. We got to go back to orthodoxy. The problem is they didn't quite go back. They just took some of the, some of the terms. Uh, and they started what today is called neo-orthodoxy. And I'm convinced that what we today call evangelicalism is the same thing as neo-orthodoxy. At one time it maybe wasn't, but it certainly is uh, today. So uh, classical, classical liberalism died, neo-orthodoxy and uh, evangelicalism was, was uh, born, and all that brings us to Kierkegaard, who is the father of existentialism. Can anyone define existentialism? <laughs> 
No, you can't because there's no definition for existentialism. That's the problem. Uh, this is why if you ever think I've heard of exist existentialism and I have no idea what it is, it's because no one has any idea what it is, including Kierkegaard, though he was considered the father of existentialism. He didn't know he was considered the father of existentialism because he died too young and it wasn't until years later that they started reading his book and uh, calling it existentialism. There's a lot of other existentialists as well. They all disagree with one another. None of them would put themselves in a camp and say, we're existentialists. And the reason is that existentialism is go with the flow, whatever you believe, it's all fine. So you can't define something that is indefinable, if, if you will. It's, uh, defining existentialism would be that old proverbial uh, nailing jello to a wall, right? Uh, you just try to figure that out. And it uh, can't be done. Uh, and it was existentialism, which uh, is uh, the uh, father of neo-orthodoxy then. I guess you could uh, maybe summarize existentialism by saying, I exist, right? But it's all about my existence. So what do I think? What do I feel? What do I believe? What do I want? Uh, it, it, is, it is very much about me, as we'll see along. Uh, so let's try to put some uh, uh, handles on it here. Uh, it is, uh, again, as I mentioned, one of these things that makes uh, no logical sense. Nobody understands it. In fact, Kierkegaard, one of his most famous lines is, I conceive it as my task to create difficulties everywhere. <laughs> And uh, he pretty much did uh, just that. Uh, and uh, perhaps the best summary is the title of one of uh, Kierkegaard's work, uh, works uh, in, uh, uh, in translation is, truth is subjectivity. Uh, when it came to existentialism and Kierkegaard, there was a great divide that was given between objective truth and what they called subjective truth. I honestly am one who doesn't even believe there is such a thing as subjective truth. Um, but they really just began to deny objective truth. And everything then began to be, what is my interaction with the things around me? What is my experience with the things around me? And that is what is truth. Uh, and so, again, truth became my existence. And this is where we began to say things like, well, that might be true for you, but for me, and uh, we'll, we'll contradict. And, and even as we begin to think that, those of us who have a solid biblical worldview ought to say, that kind of statement can't be true. What do you mean it's true for you, but it's not true for me? Uh, there is truth. There is objective truth. Uh, in fact, uh, in the scripture, there is objective meaning of scripture. And I'm convinced there's only one objective meaning of scripture, and we ought to dig in our studies to figure out what does that scripture mean? Not but what does it mean to me, not what does it mean to him, not what uh, does it mean, uh, you know, through the flow of history, but what does it actually mean? Uh, and I think that'll be the same thing with uh, with uh, any kind of uh, truth. So there is uh, the, this objective uh, truth. Objective truth would be things like Jesus was born of a virgin. Uh, Jesus died, buried, rose again. Jesus lived a sinless life. These are objective uh, points of Christianity. Uh, subjective is, uh, you know, uh, how does it affect you that Jesus, uh, that they say Jesus was born of a virgin? Or how does this idea of the virgin birth uh, interact with you and your, uh, your thoughts and uh, your feelings? Now, uh, Kierkegaard uh, did come down uh, uh, almost exclusively on the subjective. And uh, he came along and he said, what the Christian lacks is not knowledge, but rather the passion of Christianity. So, Christians have enough knowledge, they just don't have enough passion. Now, that is to say, if you have knowledge of facts, but you don't have passion, that probably is to say you're not interacting with it enough, right? And of course, this is where Kierkegaard was. It's all in the personal interaction. It's all in the in the uh, in the how does it uh, uh, affect my life and what's the meaning to me and how can every day be a Friday for me and today have my best life and all these kind of things. Uh, so 
this issue actually crept into the church and became very strong and is very strong today that the issue is passion. In fact, you've heard, uh, I, I, I think I'll call it an existentialist statement, that uh, we have often used and thought it was a good thing, and that is uh, people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. That's right. People don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. Now, now, what does that say if you really boil it down and analyze it and get uh, kind of, you know, persnickety about it? Uh, what it means is my heart is more important than my brain. Uh, my feelings are more important than the facts. Uh, and this has uh, come full you know, the, the uh, chickens have come home to roost, so to speak, in our world today when it comes to what's reality and what's my thought about reality. I uh, was uh, listening last night uh, on uh, the radio and uh, heard, uh, I was on the road, and I heard uh, someone, some lady, and I don't know the, all the situation, but uh, some lady said, uh, uh, she was joking about it because she was a conservative, but she said, uh, uh, you know that I am a male in Canada. And uh, others sort of laughed at her. And uh, she said, no, I tested this out. I, uh, I guess she must have a Canadian citizenship or something. She says, I went down to the driver's license office. She said, I had my hair uh, long, fixed like a female. I had makeup. I looked very much like a woman when I went down there. And uh, I took my driver's license, which said I was a female, and I handed it to the person at the desk and said, I identify as a male. And they said, oh, I'm sorry, we'll get this changed for you. <laughs> and so she has a male driver's license. She just wanted to check it out and see how it goes. Now, uh, what's all this? It, uh, objective truth doesn't matter anymore. What matters? How I identify myself. Uh, this is uh, all that matters. And so... It has come all the way uh, to this point. And honestly, I think that you come to a point uh, in doing this where uh, somehow anarchy begins to reign uh, because there's nothing except my feelings and your feelings. I, I, um, I may have mentioned this before, but I, I have uh, in several discussions come to the conclusion that one of the reasons that everybody is offended today, have you noticed that? Uh, everybody's offended. Uh, in fact, uh, my mother-in-law put something up on, on uh, Facebook the other day. Said, uh, and, uh, and one morning, suddenly, without reason, the entire world woke up offended. <laughs> uh, and, but, but I think there is reason to it. And that is because there is no truth. There's just my experience. So, if you come and you speak against what you're calling truth, you're actually speaking against my experience. You're speaking against me. It's a direct attack on me. And that's a lot different than a direct attack on objective truth that's outside of me. So everything now has become personal. And uh, this again uh, begins with uh, uh, Kierkegaard who comes and says it's all about the subjective basically that matters. It's all about how I interact with uh, things. And uh, so what matters then again is uh, passion. Uh, I, and, and in the church today, this idea of passion over knowledge has completely taken over. Uh, you can go, if you've tried to uh, uh, find any churches out there, uh, you will find that it's all feeling based. Uh, all of the uh, churches that are anything basically uh, and uh, the more you're in the city, the more uh, this is true, but uh, even churches in the small towns and the countries uh, try to do this. It is all, how do we elicit a certain kind of feeling? How do we stir the passion? In fact, one of the biggest uh, events every year for college students is to go to a conference that uh, has often been in Atlanta. Now I think they're moving it around. And a fellow named Louis Giglio puts out the con con uh, conference, and the conference is called Passion. One word, passion. And it's all about passion. Uh, and really the church is all about passion. Doesn't matter if they couldn't pass a basic 10 question Bible quiz. Uh, 
uh, that doesn't matter because they don't know, they don't care how much you know until they know how much you care, right? Uh, and uh, so it, uh, it it has all come down to this feeling oriented thing. And this is uh, kind of kind of rough for a guy like me who uh, has no feelings. Uh, and uh, I am uh, very much towards objective truth, and uh, I like to teach objective truth, and sometimes that objective truth does um, offend me or you or, or whatever, and the church today simply, by and large, does not uh, uh, value or appreciate objective truth. What they value is passion. So uh, I, I know that, honestly, if we wanted to really grow our church big, uh, we would uh, uh, get uh, certain lights and uh, we would have uh, a, a bunch of uh, singers up here whether they were Christian or not wouldn't really matter. Uh, can they sing? Uh, and we would do a certain kind of music, and it would be the kind of music that elicits passion. Uh, and it, could, it, it would do it, and it would work, and people would come in, and go, oh, my, I just felt so close to the Lord. Uh, but what we did is stir the passion within them. Uh, and uh, that... Uh, that music, I'm out of time too. I gotta quit and go to church here in a minute. Here, quit and start church. Uh, but uh, one of the uh, one of the things about the music that is used in churches today is uh, you may notice the newer stuff. This is not true of all of it, but very very much different from the hymns. The newer stuff doesn't have an ending, uh, and so we kind of have to sort of create an ending and go back and, and, and land the plane a little bit. Uh, but here's what I'm convinced of. Uh, I don't know all the science about this, but I'm sure it's there. Uh, that the, 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 the modern Christian music, and, and, and it comes out of the modern uh, pop music, rock and roll, whatever the, uh, the, the family tree there is, but it, uh, it has an addictive nature. And it has an addictive nature because it doesn't, doesn't end. And, and we have to have something that ends, right? Twinkle, twinkle, little. Hey, it is manipulative too, yeah. It, it's, all, it's all about me. It, it, it manipulates the emotions, right? That. And, uh, and, and we just, we need something to end. So because we, we can't get it to end, I, uh, this frustrates preachers, so I'll go ahead and talk about it. Uh, I've, you know, I've sat there a lot of times, uh, not, not here because we don't do this and the music, and besides that, I'm here. Uh, but uh, I, I've sat there as the preacher many times and the, and the worship leader just said, you know, I just feel like we should have one more song. And I'm saying, no, just end the song you're at. <laughs> That's the problem. And uh, we've already had one more and one more and one. We, we just have to drag it on because the heart cries for something to, to, to end it. And uh, we just go from one into another into another into another. Uh, and it's all uh, this uh, passion. Well, uh, I have uh, run out of uh, time and not out of outline, uh, but for, for Kierkegaard and existentialism, the crowd is untruth, actually. It is very, very, very individualistic. Uh, and uh, the, the, the moment, the me, is all that matters. And I think this is, uh, and I'll close here, I think this is the reason why um, nobody wants a label anymore. Uh, and uh, the uh, I got I got I got two things I want to say, and I'm so out of time. Um, but one, nobody wants a label. I'm going to come back to that uh, because it's all about me. One of the things you hear today, and I actually Googled this this morning, um, is that uh, this generation, and by that it's what they typically call the millennials, more than anything else, what they want is the word is authenticity, authenticity. Uh, and if you look up authenticity, you'll see that uh, they're trying to figure this out in marketing. They're trying to figure this out in, uh, in, in uh, education and government and everything else. And in church, I hear it all the time. You go to a preacher's conference, which I quit going to a long time ago, and they'll say, now this ch generation wants you to be authentic. And about the best I can come up with is, what's, uh, what's authentic? Sorry, I've been fake all these years. Uh, but, <laughs> but what is authentic? And... It, it, it appears to be that authentic is there's no real truth, so whatever your experience is, that's absolutely fine. 
uh, my experience has been this, and authentic uh, even uh, goes so far as to sort of spill all the beans, uh, and you know, I don't believe this because of my experience, and I, I happen to get caught up in this because of my experience or whatever, and that's authentic, and everybody wants that authentic. Uh, but uh, with that authentic then, they don't want any labels. So s some of you remember uh, back right after, right in the 70s, right after the battle uh, over the guitars, uh, <laughs> then we, uh, we came into the battle over the names, really. Uh, and you can almost determine when a church was started by its name. Uh, you know, if it's the First Baptist Church, then it was started, you know, uh, prior to 1960, uh, or the Trinity Baptist Church, or the Calvary Baptist Church, or whatever, uh, you know, those three words, and the second two are Baptist Church, uh, it was started prior to, uh, uh, at the latest, 1970s. Then, in the, in the 70s, and in the, in the 80s especially, it became, uh, you know, the, uh, the fellowship of uh, it wasn't a church anymore. Uh, and it might have even at the b very beginning, you know, it would have been the, uh, uh, the Trinity Baptist Fellowship. Uh, it was a fellowship, not a church. Uh, and then, uh, now it's, it's come to the point now where it's just one word. Uh, if it was started in the last uh, 10 years or so, it is grace, journey, current. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's one word. And uh, no, no label at all. What does it mean? Uh, I was thinking about this because I drove by uh, a church uh, that's uh, in uh, Katy, Texas, uh, as I was down there for the wedding this weekend, and uh, there is a church that used to be called Grace Christian Church, um, and it looked like a church when you drove by. Then they changed their name to Current. Current. That is the name of the church. Uh, yeah, like the fruit. <laughs> like, uh, I think that I, I think it's probably a double meaning. Uh, they put some rivers outside, so maybe we go with the flow. <laughs> uh, current, the flow. I'm sure they try to say the flow of the spirit or whatever. But uh, I kind of think it means we want to be relevant. Uh, in fact, there are some churches just called relevant. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and and but what what especially struck me, and I said, what a shame. They had this building that looked like a church. And now it looks like a, uh, I don't know, I'll say a warehouse. Um, they completely covered the front with the, the, you know, pointed roof and the steeple, and it's a flat front now. And uh, you, you, you could change the sign, uh, or actually the sign says current, so, uh, you know, air conditioning supply or whatever, <laughs> whatever it is, uh, uh, dual current, well, I'm not sure, you know. Uh, all of that say, we don't want any labels. We want to be authentic. But you remember when this first started happening, again, if you grew up in the, in the church, especially the Baptist church, when they quit using Baptist in the name, we argued about that at one time, didn't we? And we said, no, Baptist means something, and you need to use Baptist. And this is true in all the other denominations today. I can tell you that today, they don't even have the argument. Uh, nobody will go out and even put that on their name. If they're starting a Baptist church today, it won't be called that. In fact, it probably won't even be on the website. You're going to have a hard time finding it. Why not? Because we don't want a label. Why don't we want a label? Because a label says, I've boiled it all down to this particular set of beliefs that is commonly held by this group of people. And the group is untruth. The, because that's not my experience. My experience is very individual. And so, uh, you know, however many people we have here today, that's how many denominations we have today, uh, you know, in, 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 in the uh, sense of uh, the thinking. So, uh, in the end, then, uh, really uh, everything has uh, just changed, and individualism and pragmatism is what runs in the church today, all thanks to a guy who died in 1846 named Soren Kierkegaard, who got it started and wrote his books, and they sat on the shelf until the 1940s when everybody in the world looked around and said, what do I believe now? And uh, the church didn't have a good answer because it had gone into, into liberalism. Instead of going to orthodoxy, it went to neo-orthodoxy. And it just said, believe whatever you want to believe. And that brought about the 60s and the sexual revolution and, and uh, all that uh, has uh, taken place in, uh, uh, you know, what? If it feels good, do it. <laughs> 
uh, we're just, what's the, what's the old 60 songs? Uh, all we are is dust in the wind. You got it, the hippie back there. Uh, <laughs> all we are is dust in the wind. So, you know, hey, just live uh, because we're just dust in the wind anyway. Objective truth says we're something more than dust in the wind, doesn't it? Uh, uh, but uh, there it is. Well, church is going to start in a minute, so I better quit. Uh, let me lead us in a word of prayer.